Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Institute for Australian and Chinese Arts and Culture at Western Sydney University. I'm Professor Jing Han, the director of this institute. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that we are on Parramatta South campus, which is on the country of the Daruga people of the Daruga nation, and acknowledge their ancestors who have been the traditional owners of their country for thousands of years. We would also like to pay our respect to First Nations elders of the countries we are all sitting on today, past, present, and emerging. Welcome to RAC Art Talks series. All the videos of the previous three lectures are now on our website, which can be accessed anywhere, anytime. The excitement of this series is that for each lecture, we have invited an expert of a particular field. So the series covers a wide and diverse range of topics in art. Today for lecture four, we are thrilled to have Dr. Alex Birchmore to talk about his in-depth research on Chinese contemporary ceramics art with the title, New Expert China, New Export China, Reconciling Surface and Depth in ASEAN's Porcelain Busts, which is a part of his newly published book called New Export China, Translations Across the Time and Space in Contemporary Chinese Porcelain Art, published by University of California Press. The book traces the mirrored ways in which artists in China have used the porcelain from the 1990s to the present to shape their visions of a personal and a cultural, cultural identity. The link to Alex's new book is in the chat for anyone who is interested in getting a copy. Just a brief uh, introduction of Alex. Dr. Alex Birchmore is an art historian specializing in the study of Chinese art, past and present, with a broader focus on travel and mobility, trade and exchange, and the intersection of the personal and material. Alex received his PhD from the Australian National University in 2019. And it is interesting for you to know that Alex's supervisor was Professor Claire Roberts, Luo Qingqi, who as we know, is the leading expert in Chinese art and Chinese art history. And as we see in Chinese, Ming Shi Chu Gao Tu, a great teacher develops a brilliant student. So it's no wonder that Alex has gone on making great achievements. He's currently a lecturer of museum and heritage studies at the University of Sydney. At the end of the Alex's talk, we will take questions from audiences. So while uh, Alex is giving his lecture, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and I will collect them for Alex to respond at the end of his talk. So now, please welcome Dr. Alex Birchmore to give us his talk. Thank you, Ching, for that very generous welcome. I'm very happy to be here. I'll just get my slides up. Here we go. Um, I'm very, very pleased to follow such esteemed colleagues in the other three uh, lectures in the series as well. Uh, this is the first time I've spoken about the book in a, in a public forum too, which is also quite exciting. So um, I'll launch straight into it. So as Jing mentioned, I'm gonna focus in this talk on one of the case studies in the book, which I'll, I'll talk a bit more about now, actually. Oh, hang on, there we go. Uh, so here's the, here's the cover of the book again, and the, the blurb from the website too, which gives a bit of information. And also the lovely sculpture by Xin Ying Ho, who's another of the artists that I look at in the book, which features on the cover, um, just in a kind of larger image. So I'm going to be reading most of the talk as sort of excerpts from the book that I've, I've adapted to make them hopefully more engaging for, for a spoken context. Uh, so I'll just start by talking a bit about the book in general, and then I'll get into Arsien's work. So the artistic phenomenon that I have identified and studied in New Export China is the creation by a dispersed group of Chinese contemporary artists 
of a unique genre of ceramic art that blurs the distinctions between the past and the present, the artistic and the artisanal, the legacies of porcelain export and the global mobility that artists today enjoy. This new export China, I argue, is embedded in the experiences and emotions of our current era, so it's inherently new in both form and conception. But at the same time, it's immersed within historic currents of global trade and identified with the parallel that centuries of export have fostered between China the material and China the country. It's an art of present relevance that derives much of its significance from the cultural, social, and political discussions that animate our world. Yet the perspective it brings to these discussions is one of profound historic resonance. The installations, sculpture, photographic series, and even performances associated with this art are unmistakably Chinese in their material symbolism and iconographic vocabularies. Yet they also exemplify the extent to which national and global forms of identification have long been inextricably intertwined. Four artists are studied in the book, and, and they're studied in the book because I argue that they've emerged since the 90s as foundational representatives of the specific category of, of what, what you could call export art, which is defined in the study. So ceramicist and installation artist Liu Jianghua, whose work I put a picture of on the right, Chinese Australian painter, sculptor, and installation and recently performance artist, Asian, Hong Kong born, now New York based ceramicist, Xin Ying Ho, whose work we just saw, and the ever divisive Ai Weiwei, whose work I've also got a picture of here on the left. These four artists are distinguished not only by their shared use of porcelain, but by their exemplary cultivation of four distinct attitudes toward this medium. So Liu Jianghua has the longest professional and artistic affiliation with the material. He trained as an assembly line ceramicist in the 1970s and 1980s, and his relationship with porcelain is driven by an extensive knowledge of its history and production, but at the same time colored by a persistent uncertainty about his artistic credentials. Asian, on the other hand, initially experimented with porcelain five years after he moved from Beijing to Sydney, inspired at first by a desire to reconnect with his heritage. As a self-taught artist who had formerly worked in oil paints and plaster, his turn to ceramics was motivated by a spirit of artistic inquiry, and he created only one substantial series, the China China series, before he moved on to other materials. Xin Ying Ho's discovery of ceramics was awakened by a comparable curiosity, but her relocation to Canada inspired a more sustained academic study of the medium. Although unlike Liu Jianghua and A Xian, she works within the tradition of studio ceramics, she too has experienced some uncertainty about the fluctuating definition of her work, alternately as craft or as art. Finally, Ai Weiwei, like A Xian, has received no formal ceramics training, and he was drawn to porcelain above all by a desire to broaden his artistic horizons. But while A Xian valued the medium's aesthetic appeal, Ai Weiwei found greater inspiration in its historic associations, incorporating ceramics within a larger project of political and sociocultural demystification. So another work here by an artist who's discussed a little in the book, not as much as the four case studies, Tsai Guoqiang, who's, who's done a lot of work in porcelain too. I've included it because it represents what I was going to talk about in this particular um, section. So despite their different backgrounds, their different varying levels of expertise, and their widely divergent experiences with and understandings of ceramics, the four artists covered in New Export China share a passionate interest in the history of the porcelain industry and its long association with China and with Chineseness. Many other artists have used porcelain, as I'm sure some of the people here today know, but they do tend to lack, in my opinion, the same clarity and resolution that these four artists have developed. While such parallels indicate the extent to which Liu, Asian, Ho, and I are partic participants in a broader field of artistic engagement that continues to develop in new directions, their distinction as leading figures in the emergence and development of what I call New Export China is the primary subject of the book. In response to both the current lack of attention given to contemporary artistic uses of porcelain, although there's more and more stuff written about it, which is great, as well as the transgressive potential of the medium, the book arose from a desire to redress some of what I feel are the assumptions that do tend to prevail in the study of Chinese art. 
So the most significant and perhaps the most frequently overlooked of these, perhaps due to its very centrality, is the belief that the term Chinese art refers only to those forms of artistic practice which are defined by the expression of a self-evidently Chinese content and created by artists born within the borders of mainland China for an audience who share the same cultural traditions. Liu Zhenghua, Asian, Xin Yinghou, and Ai Weiwei, along with many other artists past and present, do not conform to these interpretive confines. On the contrary, their varied careers and their eclectic artistic approaches transgress singular cultural or geographic identification, prompting the need for an art historical model that can take such in-between spaces of inquiry into account by foregrounding the extent to which works of art acquire meaning in multiple frames of reference. But this model doesn't need to discount the formative influence of place for an artist's view of the world. The artists that I talk about have each drawn crucial inspiration from the many places that they've called home, as well as from a shared fascination with the local history of Jingdezhen, known as the world's porcelain capital. China as a geopolitical entity, as a set of cultural traditions, and as a realm of imaginative speculation is a ubiquitous presence in their work. But it is by no means the only animating force for their creative endeavors or the sole context within which their work is and can be interpreted. So rather than a single Chinese art, they reveal the existence of multiple Chinese arts inflected by the historic, cultural, social and spatial qualities of specific interpretive contexts, as well as by their various overlapping points of contact and exchange. Another work by Liu Jianghua. I'll get on to ASEAN soon. Uh, so porcelain as an expressive medium and as a category of material culture is uniquely suited to such an analysis. At the most fundamental level, vessels and sculptures of porcelain are the product of an almost alchemical process of trans transmutation, fusing water, earth, and mineral pigments in various combinations to transform malleable clay into vitrified ceramic through sustained yet controlled exposure to heat. These vessels and sculptures are then subjected to further transformation by their mobility within, across, and between interpretive contexts. Exported for centuries from China to countries where they became symbolic of both the East and the allure of distance in general, porcelain objects have long been ideal vehicles for the interplay of diverse iconographies that such movement inspires. At the same time, they retain a utilitarian function, bridging the divide that customarily separates the awe expiring, awe inspiring, and exotic from the humble and the domestic. International yet intimate, mysterious yet mundane, works of porcelain art perform multiple roles in diverse settings and they shift with ease between material functions and historical associations to suit the changing needs and desires of various collectors and consumers. The multiple identity of porcelain as a globally mobile material that remains grounded in popular visions of Chinese culture is crucial to its appeal for Liu Zhenghua, Asian, Ai Weiwei, and Xin Yinghou, and it's played a key part in their decision to incorporate this medium within their artistic practices. But at the same time, their use of porcelain reflects a range of impulses and inspirations that can be broadly divided into four core motivations. Its suitability for modular and mass production, the historical narratives and myths with which it is associated, a personal affinity with ceramics as the key to a lost identity, especially for those artists who now live outside of China, and the sensual appeal of clay and glaze as tactile registers of the exotic and the erotic. The enduring bond between China, the material, and China, the country, is central to each of these motivations. And these artists were at least partially inspired to use porcelain by a desire to harness the Chineseness with which they identified it. So Asian, for example, turned to porcelain in hope of rediscovering his heritage after he moved, as I said, from Beijing to Sydney in 1990, while Ai Weiwei was motivated by a comparable desire on his return to Beijing from New York in 1993. But at the same time, each artist subsequently came to realize that the Chineseness that they sought was a fictional and fragmentary construct that could never express the many cultural worlds as, uh, oh, sorry, many cultural, contextual, and historical influences and allegiances brought together in their personal worlds as artists and as individuals. Seeking access to a stable identity, they discovered that cultural identification, much like porcelain, is a composite product of diverse influences 
shaped as much by travel and trade as it is by more static or situated forms of knowledge. Oh, like that. Yeah. Uh, a shifting relationship between internal and external selfhood, characteristic of RCN's China China series of porcelain busts, which were created between 1998 and 2004, clearly signals this fragmenting of identity. The first 10 busts in the series, though ornamented with conventional motifs adapted from pattern books and museum pieces, show an idiosyncrasy that splits the personalities of their sitters into multiple parallel forms. On one hand, the motifs expose the models to stereotype, recalling the typecasting of culturally marked migrants. But on the other hand, an additional layer of meaning can be read into these images as markers of the subject's individuality and their various relationships with the artist. This blurring of cultural affiliation with ties of family and friendship reflects Asien's association of porcelain both with Chinese-ness as well as with the feeling that he had lost an essential aspect of his identity when he moved to Australia. After the success of China China, Asien incorporated other traditional Chinese media into his artistic practice, asserting what he perceived to be his self-assigned duty as an artist of Chinese heritage to revive historic forms for a contemporary context. In pursuing this duty, he has benefited from the advantages of a life in between, based in Sydney, but traveling as needed between China and Australia. Most of his busts were produced in the country of his birth, molded by the artist, but painted and fired by artisans in Dinglija. But in, in contrast to the first 10 busts, these pieces draw on a limited range of designs combined in various permutations to create a sense of collective identity in which the cultural takes precedence and in which any indication of a relationship between model and motif is abandoned or seemingly abandoned. Although these could be associated with an acceptance of stereotype, they also emphasize the artifice of any alleged essence, reducing traits that seem inherent to a patchwork of fragments adopted or discarded at will. Selfhood is thereby revealed to be an ongoing project, negotiating with various dimensions of personal and cultural meaning. So these images that I accidentally showed before, this is Asien with uh, John Yu in the process of making what would become his, his portrait bust of Dr. John Yu, which isn't technically part of the China China series, but sort of is a, uh, an epilogue to the series that happened um, in 2004-2005. Uh, uh, the first 10 China China busts were created in 1998 at Sydney College of the Arts, where Asien developed the method of mold making that you see here and that remains central to his artistic practice. The process of creating these and later busts in porcelain as well as other media begins with a plaster cast of the head and shoulders of the model, usually a friend or family member. To create a cast, the model must first strip down to the waist so that Asien can swath their head and upper body in cling wrap leaving only their nostrils uncovered. And they're then wrapped tightly with bandages soaked in plaster. And after several layers of these have been applied, they must sit for almost an hour, waiting for the plaster to harden and remaining as still as possible. The resulting cast can be used to produce an impression in porcelain or any other moldable material. When he created his, uh, his first porcelain busts, he chose to ornament these with a range of stereotypically Chinese motifs, including floral patterns, dragons, plum trees and blossom, lotuses and waves. In the SCA busts, these are superimposed over the features of three models. A young woman of Asian heritage who was likely a student, Asian's brother, the photographer Liu Xiaoxian, and the artist's wife, Ma Li Hong. Both Liu and Hong moved with Asian from Beijing to Sydney in 1990, and they're each precisely replicated in porcelain in the series. Their faces rendered so uniform by the clay that ornament has become their primary distinguishing quality. At first, some might assume that these are relatively straightforward portraits of Chinese people in a Chinese medium painted with Chinese motifs by a Chinese artist. Yet another analogy for the typecasting of a culturally marked migrant. This reading is encouraged by the identification of each bust with a number rather than with a name, imparting a universalizing relatability as well as by the doubled title of the series with its play on the two meanings of China. But on closer inspection, the motifs reveal additional meaning as markers of identity and sensitive registers of the subject's relationship with the artist. 
Cultural affiliation is overlaid with family and friendship, while iconographic interpretation intersects with a deeply personal sphere of significance. So the restrained underglaze blue and overglaze copper red ornament on this bust, for example, bust four, which is a portrait of Mali Hong, implies a balance of intimacy and convention that likely reflect, reflects the artist's affection for his subject. Her lifelike expression is the most striking feature of the work, suffused with tranquil contemplation and animated by a slight smile that lingers on the upturned corner of her mouth. The endearing irreverence of this subtle movement is enhanced by a paired lotus bud and leaf that respectively cover and sit just above her closed eyes, suggesting a wink and a raised eyebrow. The slender stalks of this lotus emerge from the lustrous white skin of her collarbones, reaching up her neck and across her cheeks to mingle with the leafy canopy of her hairline. Another leaf rests on her right shoulder and her collarbone. The lotus has long been associated with Buddhist practice and thought as a plant that rises undefiled from impure muddy waters to produce a pure white flower, an analogy for the life of integrity rising above the pollutions of the everyday. They are additionally an emblem of love, homophonous with uh, words meaning harmony and meaning peace. So homophonous meaning they, they sound the same, as well as with the terms for connection and attachment or longing. Arsian's choice of a lotus to ornament Hong's features then could allude to their shared affection and perhaps also to his vision of her rising above the struggles of daily life to a higher realm of being. A comparable reading could be applied to the artist's portrayal of his brother in this bust, bust 10, the final addition to the series entirely created by Arsian's own hands. In contrast to bust four, flowers are not the primary decorative element here and the design is neither restrained nor subtle. Liu's shoulders and neck bear a rhythmic seascape of tempestuous waves. His head is covered with an uneven ground of blue pigment punctuated by a stylized cloud pattern. His eyes and nose are obscured by the face of a dragon encircling the crown of his head and extending over his ear to assume a central, almost confrontational position that has prompted some writers to describe the work as claustrophobic. The presence of a dragon instead of floral motifs and the vigor with which this image has been applied have also given rise to associations with masculinity. Flowers, it is argued, are feminine, implying elegance and restraint, while dragons and waves are masculine, painted with forthright audacity. But while the dragon is associated in China with ferocity and natural power, it also denotes benevolence and nurturing protection. The creature encircling Liu's head then, rather than a suffocating constraint, could be an apotropaic talisman. This reading could be reinforced by the clouds, which are homophonous with term, a term meaning good fortune, as well as by the wish-granting jewel that the dragon pursues, resting on Liu's chin. Like the lotus, this jewel is an emblem of transcendence, as well as of the emergence of purity from the mire of daily existence, symbolizing a third association of the dragon with the natural processes of growth and metamorphosis. The combination of these elements, dragon, clouds, waves, and jewel, has been common since the Song dynasty, intended to emphasize the dragon's role as a bringer of life-sustaining waters signifying abundance, longevity, and cosmic union. So in addition to masculine virility then, the motifs on bust 10 can also be read as a wish for good fortune from the artist to his brother, a reassurance that life and the potential for transcendence will always endure, even in the most overwhelming of circumstances. In bust 10, as in bust four and the remaining SCA busts, cultural motifs gain new significance as markers of personality, family, and friendship transforming culture from a restrictive mark of imposed difference into an internal wellspring of communal support. Arsian's turn to porcelain can similarly be traced to his vision of this medium as an ancestral inheritance. He was born in Beijing on the eve of the Cultural Revolution. The son of two scholars, he spent his formative years on the campuses of Runbin University and the Beijing Institute of Technology. After graduating high school, he was assigned employment as a fitter in a state-owned factory before deciding in 1982 to pursue his dreams of becoming an artist, which was a radical statement at the time. In 1983, while in Shenzhen, he adopted the pseudonym Asian in preference to his birth name. After his return to Beijing, he gained some notoriety 
for a relatively substantial body of work in oils on canvas, including, including this one. This one wasn't as uh, uh, controversial as others. It was mostly the use of the nude figure that aroused controversy at the time. Uh, in January 1989, he uh, left the capital again for a two-month artist residency at the University of Tasmania, and then the unfortunate coincidence of his second return to Beijing with the Tiananmen Square protests prompted him to accept a follow-up invitation to show his work in Sydney in September 1990 as an opportunity to relocate permanently to Australia. Following this relocation, his first trip back to the Sinosphere notably involved a stay in Dingdezhen. So he traveled first to Beijing to see his mother, who had contracted an illness to which he unfortunately succumbed two days before his arrival, which was delayed by visa complications. But stopping in Dingdezhen on the return leg, the frustrations of an in-between existence, separated from family and past, may perhaps have been etched in his mind, strengthening his attraction to porcelain as a means to bridge this divide. The idea to create cast porcelain figures had actually occurred to Arsien two years earlier, in 1994, after he had completed several installations that included plaster cast replicas of hands and feet. Although these works were successful and, and garnered very positive criticism, he found plaster aesthetically unappealing, clinical and dull, while porcelain in contrast seemed alluring and evocative, durable yet just as malleable as plaster and enlivened by a precious fragility. He read manuals on ceramics making and built a small kiln in his garden to fire porcelain versions of his casks. Then in 1995, he met Wu Yen, a young woman who had moved to Sydney from, from Jingdezhen and who, had put, who put him in touch with Zhou Xiaosong, vice director of the Jingdezhen Ceramic Institute at the time. Astian and Zhou exchanged letters for several months until in May 1996, after his homecoming, he found an opportunity to continue his studies in the porcelain capital. He had learned of the city's history and he wished to explore any possibility for further training. So while his mother's illness was, of course, the primary reason for his return to China, Asian therefore also perhaps desired to reignite feelings of cultural belonging and to reclaim a birthright that soon became inextricably entangled with Jingzhejian and porcelain. Some quotes here from Asian instead of pictures. Asian turned to ceramics in a spirit of artistic inquiry, searching for a material that could be cast in, cast in the same way as plaster, while yielding a more appealing result. But it was this sense of re reviving his heritage that ultimately gained greater significance. As a self-taught artist, he has experimented with many materials over his career, from oil painting and mixed media collage to plaster casting and installation. In hindsight, porcelain is just the first of many such traditional media that he adopted after the success of China China, including cloisonne, lacquer, jade, bronze, semi-precious stones, and scholar's rocks. He announced his intent to adapt tradition not long after embarking on the China China series in a paper that he presented at the Asian Art Society of Australia's Contemporary Asian Art Forum in October 1998. So to quote, in my understanding, we, meaning Chinese artists, possess a richness of cultural resources and wealth that are beautiful and almost unassailable. So why do we let them go to waste instead of constructing them into new treasures? Porcelain is elevated here from a substitute for plaster to a precious cultural resource in need of salvation by those who have inherited it as a birthright, but have been denied access to their heritage by historical and political circumstance. Asian then clarified this aspiration just over a decade later in conversation with Catherine Wells, reaffirming its centrality for his work. Quoting again, among the ideas of why I use these materials in my artwork is to show that they are not just about ancient heritage and traditions, they are also current, creative, up-to-date, and compatible with contemporary art concepts and ideas. As these extracts illustrate, Asian identifies his duty as a Chinese artist with the revival of traditional forms for contemporary audiences. He's defined his turn to traditional media as an issue of survival, inspired by a need to remain true to himself and to the specific culture from which he draws strength. Speaking with Melissa Chu in 2001, he noted that even if someone is away from China, they recognize themselves as being Chinese, and they even have a clearer vision of China and Chinese culture. 
he discovered this clarity in Sydney, separated by distance and time from his birthplace, but more aware than ever of the complexities of cultural identity and determined to explore these through art. Just an image of Arsene Strudeau that he hopefully doesn't mind me sharing, which I took when I visited in um, 2014. Many writers on Arsene's work have linked his use of traditional materials, and you can see a few of those here, with the political violence and repression that he witnessed during the 1960s and 70s, when his access to art, like many others, was frustrated by the destruction of books deemed counter-revolutionary. His parents attempted to counter his neg this negative influence by enrolling him in after-school classes, where he studied drawing, calligraphy, ink painting, and seal carving. They'd also preserved an encyclopedia of artisanal arts at their home, a splendid silk-bound hardcover first edition of Arts and Crafts of China, published in 1959, lavishly illustrated with samples of porcelain, lacquer, cloisonne, as well as other media, which may have prompted Arsian's later fascination with these materials. So he therefore came to know porcelain at first in an intimate and quite circumspect context. And it was perhaps the memory of this childhood experience that inspired his later use of the material to evoke an internal world. Beyond the limited resources of this private sphere, Arsene's access to art at the time was almost non-existent. Antiques were considered too redolent of the past to be displayed in public, while temples and palaces that housed collections of such objects were deemed irrelevant and were repurposed into schools or community centers. Denied access to China's heritage in his formative years, Arsene may have developed a strong attraction to the material traces of this heritage later in life, a heightened awareness of its value, and a deep appreciation of the need to protect it from the threat of obliteration. The first China China busts were created during an artist residency at the Sydney College of the Arts, as I mentioned, with the benefit of materials, equipment, training, and a cohort of enthusiastic students. In the following year, he then received an Australia Council New Work grant to fund a nine-month stay in Dingdezhen, which was his second trip to the city, during which he commissioned artisans to mould and paint 43 additional busts. He then sold his first bust in the same year to the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, followed by sales to the Queensland Art Gallery and to the NGA in 2000. The NGA then awarded Arsien the inaugural National Sculpture Prize in 2001, which funded his third trip to Jingdezhen in 2002, and he then received an Australia Council Fellowship to support his fourth and final journey in 2004. Arsien has resisted a technique-driven, virtuosic approach to ceramics in favour of what he defines as a conceptualist attitude to the medium. A concise explanation of this approach can be found in another of his published statements, delivered in his capacity as a judge for the 10th Sydney Meyer Fund International Ceramics Award in 2008, in which he set forth a manifesto of sorts for a conceptually motivated vision of ceramic art. Recasting his earlier statement on the need to adapt traditional techniques in a more declamatory mode, he begins by decrying the isolation of ceramics from the artistic mainstream, stuck to one side in a gray and shady area, as well as the conservatism with which they had customarily been associated. To combat this and to inject new blood and energy into the medium, he called for ceramicists to abandon technique and to disrupt the definition of ceramic art as one of process and redefine it as one of critical conceptualization, albeit with an emphasis on skilled technical ability. Technique, he asserted when given primary importance, becomes a large yet invisible cocoon, suppressing the desire, passion and courage to break barriers and cross the border to the outside. While this core message of Arsene's 2008 address is consistent with his SCA busts, an apparent contradiction does seem to emerge when we turn to the 73 busts that he commissioned artisans in Tindijan to produce in 1999, 2002, and 2004. These heralded a shift toward what is perhaps a less conceptually rigorous, more superficially appealing aesthetic, prompted by, perhaps by the increasing interest from galleries and private collectors that he enjoyed as he established the signature style. The first 10 works in the series are very intimate pieces, cast and painted personally by the artist himself during a year of great personal and artistic discovery. Those produced in Jingdezhen, in contrast, suggest a fascination with aesthetic variety 
with technical virtuosity, as well as with the potential for modular mass production afforded by a system of labor delegation. In these works, the cultural takes priority over the personal, both because their quantity and variety make the search for the private an almost impossible task, and because the relationship between model and motif seems to have been largely abandoned. Yet these busts proved so appealing for collectors and so lucrative for Asien that several other Chinese-Australian artists subsequently, subsequently created limited series in porcelain, notably including Guan Wei, who spoke in the first lecture in this series, and Zhou Xiaoping. Further building on Asien's precedent, these artists combined the exotic allure of a Chinese medium for Australian buyers with locally sourced imagery, drawing inspiration from Aboriginal designs and iconographies. This fusion to some extent elevates their work beyond the reductive logic of the market. But nevertheless, all three artists were no doubt aware, at the very least, of the beneficial returns that a material as desirable as porcelain might attract. However, despite the deviation of his Jingde Jun busts from his earlier style, for many writers on Asian's work, the former actually represent the true blossoming of his artistic vision, while the SEA busts are frequently dismissed as prototypes, blueprints. They're termed hesitant and crude or lacking authenticity. Asian himself at the time of their creation regarded the first 10 busts as experiments, and he wasn't entirely satisfied with the results, a feeling which perhaps partially derived from his sense that he lacked the required technical skills. This perceived lack likely inspired his desire to visit Jing the Jun to improve his technique and also reinforced his association of porcelain with a heritage denied. From this perspective, the Jing the Jun busts signify perhaps an acceptance, even an embrace of the cultural stereotypes applied to migrants, concealing the private beneath an ornamented surface. Interior and exterior are now decisively separated with a skin of culture stretched over an inner world that remains inaccessible to all but those who dwell within. A few examples can illustrate this shift, starting with the final three works in the series, Bust 78, 79, and 80, all created in 2004. Each of these is adorned with lotus flowers that recall those on Bust 4, but that have been shaped in a completely different style. So while the lotuses on Bust 4 are painted under the glaze, here they rest on the surface as applied decoration unfurling in paper-thin blooms across the subject's skin and coated in a viscous, southern glaze that pools in undulations of flesh and flower alike. The luminous translucence of this glaze insulates the sitter from the external world, encasing them within a heavy shroud, which is quite unlike the transparent glaze of the SCA busts, beneath which the white clay and the subject's features remain clearly visible. At the same time, the lotus flowers in these later busts don't adhere to the figure or follow the lines of their features, but rest gently on their skin as if about to peel away like the leaf on the shoulder of bust 79. Inner and outer meaning are thereby made independent, caught in a last fleeting moment of contact before their final separation. Any lingering suggestion of the personal is dispelled by the impassivity of the model's features. Each bust recreates a different woman, yet their lack of hair, their shared ornament, and their uniform cellar glaze render them difficult to discern. They seem almost aloof and alien, even inhuman. Although similar in ornament and subject to bust four, these pieces could not be more distinct in their tension between different forms of identification. A comparable impassivity and separation of model and motif can be noted in bust 45, created in 1999 which extends the wave pattern seen on bus 10, but across the, ent the entire figure. In this case, this is Asian's father. In the earlier piece, the waves were linked to the central dragon motif, standing in for a tempestuous ocean or a reservoir of life-giving waters, and they evoked a familial bond shared by artist and subject. In bust 45, however, they seem frozen in repetitive uniformity, carved in light relief into the surface of the porcelain, and as in busts, 78, 79, and 80, coated with an unctuous glaze that's more suggestive of an impenetrable carapace than a tender embrace. The sitter's features are hidden by rhythmic incised lines. His mouth is reduced to a sinuous curve, his nose visible only by its protuberance from the subtle creases of his cheeks, and the hollows of his eyes are almost imperceptibly divided by the meeting of eyelids. <laughs> 
Again, there's no correlation between model and motif. The inner world of the subject is concealed within an ornamental shell. The same impression of a hardened carapace is apparent in bust 67 of 2002, in which the anonymity of the figure has become so acute that they are almost androgynous, in contrast to the gendering of motifs on the SEA busts. For this work, Asian developed the all-over pattern used on bust 45 into a close-fitting mantle, a three-dimensional rendering of a motif that has long been used as a decorative filler. The iridescent glaze does bleed slightly into the grey-white biscuit porcelain, yet the two remain distinct. In contrast to the partial obscuring of facial features in bust 45, here the face is defiantly unadorned, even if the personality of the sitter remains elusive. The motif is neither fused with the skin nor attached like a shell, but is instead overlaid like a fitted piece of clothing. The separation of model and motif is comparable to that seen in the other busts, but while the glaze unified all elements in the latter into a single composition, on bust 67, even this concession to aesthetic harmony is abandoned. The sitter's internal world is impenetrable, ornamented but not suffocated by a sumptuous, alluring mantle that seems to be worn by choice rather than compulsion. These few examples of the Jingdezhen busts, and I've got a few more examples here, while they show a clear separation of the personal and cultural, offer only a suggestion of the overwhelming modularity of the entire series of, of um, well, 70 busts, not including the 10 SCA ones. As the repetition of motifs from the SCA busts in busts 78, 79, 80, and 45 shows, ASEAN reuses and adapts a relatively limited range of designs. Dragons and other creatures of myth appear on nine busts. Landscapes and various combinations of flowers, birds, and butterflies each appear on 13, comprising a third of the entire group. Almost all of these motifs are sourced from pattern books and catalogues of antique ceramics, given to the artisans whose careers actually now depend on their talent for reproducing historic wares. In one workshop, for example, ASEAN employed 10 artisans who are celebrated for their replication of Ming and Qing dynasty blue and white vases, plates, and sculptures. While ASEAN directed the creative process, all other aspects of this process, aside from the initial casting and molding of the busts, using a press molding technique, not the slip casting process that ASEAN had learned at SEA, were completed by teams of artisans, each responsible for a single painted, incised, carved, or applied motif, glazing technique, or overglaze enamel. Artisans and motifs alike were selected by the artist after visiting workshops across the Tindijan, poring over pattern books, and studying exemplary wares. The concept-driven aspects of making, of contact with the models and molding busts to the selection of designs therefore remained under ASEAN's control, while the more practical tasks were delegated to artisans. Though it's not quite as simple as that because the adaptation of certain motifs to the irregular forms of several busts did require great expertise and was a time-consuming task involving extended interaction between artists and artisans over long periods of time. At heart, however, despite the differences in their making, the SCA and the Jingdezhen busts are united by a sense of fractured identity that reflects the artist's experiences of the in-between. While his works in porcelain and other media are produced in China, Asien is almost unknown in that country and has only exhibited there once in April 2000 at Beijing Normal University. Even this exhibition, largely due to its venue, attracted a limited audience of students and friends leaving a relatively shallow impression in the city's arts community. But ASEAN's displays in Australia, the United States, and Europe, on the other hand, attract large audiences, and he's now, of course, recognized as a leading Australian contemporary artist. He is, therefore, the quintessential in-between creator. Originating in his desire to reconnect with the lost heritage after moving to Australia, China China and later series served only to confirm for ASEAN that this vision of culture was comparably artificial and that his Chineseness is more complex than any stereotype allows. Shot through with personal and experiential dimensions of meaning and intersected by bonds of family and friendship, it is a fabrication of his own making on his own terms. Thank you. That's all I've got. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, for this wonderful, so informative and um, fascinating talk. We now know a lot about uh, contemporary uh, porcelain 
ceramics art and in particular ASEAN. Yeah, this is fascinating, it's really interesting. Want to hear more? Um, now we are open to questions. So anyone who has questions, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of the screen. But I have a first question and actually a couple. And um, it's really fascinating to hear you talking about, you know, uh, Chinese contemporary art. You know so much about it. So my first question is very much on your personal background. Can you tell us a bit more about your, you know, um, uh, academic background or uh, personal background? I mean, you know, what brought you or made you interested in studying uh, Chinese contemporary art and art history? It was, I mean, Claire played a large role because <laughs> she was such a such an inspiration. I actually, um, by st I started by studying visual arts in my undergraduate degree, and I I, I didn't study ceramics. Ironically, I studied drawing and printmaking and then I kind of moved on from that into art history uh, I ended up this was in Adelaide where I, where I was at the time I ended up studying art history at a postgraduate level uh, when Claire was at the University of Adelaide at that time and I guess it was through her that I first became interested in Chinese contemporary art and Chinese art in general uh, as well as Southeast Asian art which I'm also still quite strongly interested in but it was really, I mean, it was really seeing Arsien's work too. And I met Arsien through Claire around that same time, but it was seeing his work on display at the Art Gallery of South Australia alongside some historic uh, Blanc de Chine wares, which is um, like, a, like a type of ceramic with a very white glaze. And the, the, just the, the resonance between those two and the sense that there was this long history of ceramics and that artists were doing really fascinating things with it kind of, I don't know, spoke to me. It sounds a bit cliche, but it, it spoke to me on some level, and I decided to pursue that for my doctoral studies, which I then ended up doing at the Australian National University. And I guess it's yeah, continued from there. You know, when you come to uh, Chinese uh, art or Chinese painting or ceramics, what sort of a um, thing that uh, interests you the most? You know, what thing that uh, strikes you? That are, because you do need to have a strong attraction to it before you decide to do a PhD. Mm. I, I, I'll, I'd never call myself an expert on Chinese painting, but definitely uh, with ceramics, I guess it's the it's more the the medium. I suppose it's the kind of that mix of uh, of the domestic, like it's something that's so familiar and so comfortable and everyday, but also at the same time, it's this global trade commodity, and it has this amazing history of different kind of mythologies of production and just the, the scale of the production as well. It was that aspect of ceramics that appealed to me. And then I suppose that that link between China, the material and China, the country led me to, to, to study China. And um, I ended up living there for, for a year and studying the language and seeing, I guess, that the culture of ceramics was really quite influential and the way in which it's so linked with um, with tea and other aspects of connoisseurship and things like that. But yeah, it's 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 kind of at a material level, I would say. My interest lies. Mm. Which city did you go to? I mean, which university did you study in China? It was Beijing Foreign Studies University. Oh, that's my university. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, in relation to your, um, you know, fascination over material ceramics, as you mentioned, and um, to me, after hearing you, and I found it's really surprising to see actually how versatile ceramics can be as an art form, you know, so all the examples that you gave to us, and those are Chinese artists in your presentation, created a very diverse range of artworks with the ceramics. And I quite like the title of your book, New Export China, China, you know, playing on the word which you mentioned a few times, China as a country and China as a, a ceramics as material. And, but China, even as a country, is very well known for uh, ceramics. Do you find it surprising that all these four highly successful international Chinese artists uh, have used the ceramics as their creative art form? I mean, they all approached it from different angles, which mm. is the most interesting thing. And they all have this very kind of, oops, sorry, getting even darker, this very kind of deep connection with it on different levels. 
and that's something I explore in the book. But it is, I mean, it is a very versatile medium, which I think is what attracts people to it. Liu Jianhua obviously has that factory experience. Ai Weiwei came to it mostly through the history, but also through other things. Asian through the the artistic potential, and Xin Yinghuo is perhaps the, I guess, the pure ceramicist in the group. But yeah, it's the I think what appeals to them is the versatility and also the symbolic connotations, things like the potential for mass production as a, as a medium that's so tied to that and the idea of modularity uh, and just the, yeah, the tactile appeal of it as well, because it has such a, uh, I think it, it, just as I'm fascinated with that kind of material aspect, I think these artists and other artists are also fascinated with that too. Mm. Uh, just the last bit in relation to my question on this line, um, what do you think are the fundamental challenges uh, in creating contemporary ceramics as art form, like a form or content? I think probably the chief challenge, the primary challenge, not so much now, but initially, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, was the definition of their art, which is something that Cindy Ho in particular faced. And I, I, some, I mean, sometimes when I've been in galleries and uh, with ASEAN's work on display, I've heard, overheard people remarking about um, you know ceramics and teapots and things like that but I think it's the association of it with with craft or with uh, with the decorative arts and the, the way in which we view that uh, in Australia and in other European societies obviously it's very different in China although even still the use of it for contemporary art is perhaps or was perhaps at that time quite a jarring concept so there's that but I mean I mean I think that's less so now because we've kind of moved into a space where more and more artists are using ceramics, so it's much more uh, it's much more familiar to us. The other thing, though, I think is a major challenge is just the level of expertise that's required to use ceramics, which is why so many of them go to Jingdezhen, because they can have access to people who have uh, decades of expertise, generations of expertise, who can produce their works almost on demand, I suppose, or on order. Whereas it's quite difficult to do it yourself, especially if you don't have all the materials, the kiln, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I would say it's a definition and also expertise are the main challenges. Hmm. Uh, we go to uh, audience a few questions. The first is Tessa. Tessa asks, are there similarities between Chinese and Korean porcelain? For sure, there are massive similarities between Chinese and Korean porcelain. Uh, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the Korean. I guess if we're talking in terms of historic examples, a lot of the Korean really. Uh, important works of Korean ceramics were quite inspired by Chinese ceramics and inspired by different things like, I suppose, like celadon glaze, uh, blue and white, obviously, was a major influence. So yes, is the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. And coincidentally, I actually saw an exhibition in Canada, they put a porcelain works of a Chinese and Korean together. So yeah, the reason for the connection. Uh, Fan Duong has a question. Have you visited China often and what you have seen there? Well, I haven't visited for a few years for uh, reasons that I'm sure are obvious, but um, I, I have visited before that on and off uh, in terms of what I've seen there. Um, I mean, I mostly just kind of visited the big museum collections and just kind of marveled at the range of things that were there and, and the, the beautiful porcelains. And, and I suppose, as I said before, the the attitudes toward porcelain and ceramics and the difference in the way it's perceived, I guess, in terms of a cultural hierarchy really stood out for me and was actually in the early stages of my doctoral studies, which is when I when I lived there, it was very uh, energizing and quite uh, affirmative for the path that I'd chosen because initially it seemed to me, why am I looking at porcelain? But then when I went there, I realized that there was such this this culture of porcelain and this really strong uh, interest in it that, that it was it was a, a really interesting thing to look at. Hmm. Talking about that I actually have a quick question because you are interested in research also including mobility. Uh, any connection between porcelain you know so ceramic arts and mobility? Oh yes yes definitely um, I mean it was it was the one of the most lucrative and most desired trade products for centuries on, on what you could call China trade. And it is profoundly mobile as, a, as an object. It's something that can very easily travel uh, on, well, on ships. It's quite heavy to travel on land. Um, 
but yeah, there's a there's a really central link, and that work by Tsai Wo Chang that I showed the uh, reflection, a gift from Iwaki, kind of I guess riffs on that mobility of porcelain and the link with with uh, seaborne trade and with um, uh, travel and exchange and that kind of thing. Yeah, and that's I mean I guess that's why I call the book New Export China was because it's it's this it's this uh, emblematic substance, especially blue and white again. It's this emblematic uh, trade commodity or trade object or, or um, object that crosses cultures. Hmm. So interesting because it's sort of a um, contradictory with the uh, material, which is a so fragile, you know, ceramics or possibly so fragile. You sort of tend not to associate it with uh, moving around so, um, you know, on the rough sea and stuff. I mean, that's one of the fascinations of porcelain is that it's so fragile in some senses, but so durable in other senses, because it can remain buried underground or, or underwater perfectly intact. And you can bring it out and you have to clean off the, the things that have encrusted on it while it was down there. But otherwise, it can last for, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. But you could just drop it and it smashes into a, into a thousand fragments. It's... Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, extremely well explained. Yeah, the contradictory uh, features of a ceramics and a porcelain. Uh, Karen has a question. I'm interested in whether any of the other artists you have investigated, meaning apart from Asian, make their work entirely by themselves or whether they all worked with teams? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. One of the main things that separates them, actually. So Asian, he made the first 10 busts by himself or with some help in the SCA studios and then worked quite closely with artisans. And it was quite a collaborative relationship. I think initially they were a bit uh, miffed by being asked to create human forms when usually they would make things like vessels and uh, uh, perhaps sculpture, but not sculpture like this. But in the end, I think they, they, they came around. Ai Weiwei, of course, uh, famously so for Sunflower Seeds, uh, commissioned uh, 1,200 artisans in Jingdezhen to hand paint and, and hand press the, the 100 million sunflower seeds in the work. Uh, and in the book, I talk about, I guess, the differences between the, the two ways that those artists worked with the artisans. So Ai, Ai Weiwei's relationship was perhaps more of a contractual, uh, quite a, a very massive scale relationship. Asian's was much more uh, collaborative, much more um, interpersonal. Liu Jianghua, uh, he sort of, he does make a lot of his own work in ceramics because he does have an extensive background in ceramics. And he often works with people that he initially met on the uh, assembly lines in the 1970s when he worked at um, what, what was then the sculpture factory. So he again has quite an interpersonal, quite friendly relationship that, that has been going for quite some time. Uh, Sin Ying Ho makes all of the ceramics herself because she is very much in that studio ceramics tradition. So she's studied in Jingde Zhen, she's studied in, uh, She's currently in New York, but she studied in Canada as well. So she is the one who who doesn't really use much of the um, artisanal labor in Jingde Zhen. She she works there in the workshops, and I think she perhaps has helpers, but she does a lot of it herself. So yeah, it's very much a continuum, and the same is true of other artists too. Hmm. And obviously, Jing Dezhen, you have mentioned it many times. It's really the international capital capital of a possibly. What's so special about Jing Dezhen porcelain? You know, is that the clay? Is that the kiln? Is that the water? Or is that, what is it made it so special? All of the above. And also the location. It's, it's very well located. It's currently, I think, not the official porcelain capital. I think that's now Tzujou, I believe. Uh, it lost the title. It's now very much more uh, focused on, actually focused on artists. A lot of artists go to Jing Dezhen and, and have residencies there and work with the locals artisans, uh, as well as artists in China. There's this kind of a whole set called uh, Jing Dezhen drifters who come and go and, and work there sometimes and other times. But historically, yes, I mean, it, it sort of arose. Some people say in the Tang dynasty, it got its name in the Song dynasty, and then it just became the center of porcelain production because of the clay, so it had really good deposits of kaolin clay and petents and other things which are needed for making porcelain. Because of the, the rivers, it's at the confluence of, of a couple of rivers. It's very close to places like Chenzhou and um, other trading ports. It's quite easy to travel back and forth. Uh, it wasn't the only center, but it did become 
the major center, I think also because of blue and white, of, of course, as the main product of Ding Le Jam for many centuries and the most, most lucrative and most desired product. Mm. A few artists that I met, so they said they, because of the COVID, they couldn't go back to China or go to China's Jinzhejiang. They actually stopped making ceramic art because they're not being able to access Jinzhejiang. So it's a quite fascinating. In relation to Jinzhejiang, last question from Louise Guest. Um, Louise said, I'm interested in the distinctions between the artists who make work in Jinzhejiang and the artisans who live and work there. Can you comment on this perhaps a hierarchy relationship in which the artisans are almost always anonymous and unacknowledged? Very good question. I mean, it is sadly the case that the artisans are almost always anonymous and unacknowledged. Uh, I mean, it is sometimes, I, I suppose, as I said, there's, a, there's a, a continuum, which I trace in much more detail in the book, a bit of a plug. Um, but definitely some artists, I mean, it's very easy, I suppose, to to take advantage of that situation. But then, in other ways, why not? I guess because I mean, art art has always been produced with the help of expert artisans, and those artisans generally weren't weren't credited. I mean, to us, it kind of it kind of seems an awful thing, and and it is in a certain sense. Some artists do credit them. There's another example I cite in the book. Uh, actually, a North American ceramicist, Barbara Diddock, who who made an installation called. Um, uh, landscape in blue, and she worked with 101 artisans in Jingdezhen and credited them all by name and had pictures of them in the exhibition. And it's kind of the the gold standard, I guess, in terms of collaborating and um, collectivism. But on the whole, they they kind of go unacknowledged, sadly. And also the other, uh, I suppose, another reason why I called it New Export China is that much like export porcelain of the past, it's produced in Jingdezhen, but then it leaves Jingdezhen very rapidly and it's shown and enjoyed outside of Jingdezhen. And the artisans often don't know where, they, where they're sending it, they don't know why they're making it or who they're making it for or what the significance of it is. So it's very much, there's a parallel there between the export porcelain of the past, which was also created in that context, and this new, new export China of the present. Mm. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Alex, Alex, again, for your brilliant talk. And we have learned so much. And actually, our next art exhibition will feature an uh, artist who works in uh, with the ceramics, uh, Geng Xue. So that will come shortly up. Uh, I would also like to announce that the next lecture of the IEC Art Talks will be delivered by Chris Chung, a highly successful artist himself and an expert in chinoiserie, a very interested and a highly specialized field. Chris's talk, The Secret History of Chinoiserie, will be on 23rd of August at 5 p.m. We will send out an invitation. Thank you again, Alex, and thank you all, audience, again, for your interest and for your support. Have a good evening. <laughs>